Welcome to the backstory on the Veterans Community Project, the VCP Village in Longmont. My name is Tim Waters, and as a volunteer for Longmont Public Media, I have the good fortune of interviewing experts, activists, elected officials, uh, community leaders on topics of, of interest and kind of varied uh, implications for the community of Longmont. And today, I have the good fortune of interviewing three stars in a project that is uh, making great strides in Longmont. The very first uh, backstory, which was then just an audio uh, podcast, uh, featured the Veterans Community Project and the Veterans Village that was a vision to occur in Longmont. Two of the participants in that first podcast were Mark Solomon and, and Kevin Mulshine two of the, of the faces you see on the screen right now, and we're gonna do more formal introductions in a minute. But 18 months ago or so, February of 2018, was the first backstory. Today, we are recording this backstory on the occasion of the groundbreaking for the Veterans Community Village in Longmont. And there are a lot of miles that have been covered, a lot of hurdles that have been left since then, and it's time to tell the next chapter or the next phase of that backstory for Longmont. So gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me in this, for this recording of this episode of the backstory. More importantly, thank you for the extraordinary commitment to and contributions to veterans. Um, where this whole project started in Kansas City and Mark, I'm gonna ask you to you know, tell some of that background and then more importantly, moving forward, uh, where we're headed in terms of housing veterans, homeless veterans in Longmont. So welcome uh, on the screen for viewers. We have Mark Solomon, who is a Lieutenant Commander in the uh, Coast Guard. He's in United States Navy, Navy Reserve. <laughs> Navy Reserve. And, uh, and people ought to know, uh, Mark, as we're recording this, you're 48 hours away from being redeployed. Yes, and correct. So God bless be, you. Uh, leaving for a year. Yeah. Uh, so you're going to head off with, um, uh, I know, with a whole bunch of people uh, thinking about you. You won't be in the uh, you won't be in town, but you'll be in the hearts and minds of a whole whole lot of Longmonts. Kevin Moshine. Uh Kevin is a now a Longmont resident. Eighteen months ago, I think he was a Niwot yes. resident. So he yes. he got smarter and moved into Longmont. Yeah. So we're so welcome to Longmont, Kevin. Thank you. And uh, and Kevin has played a significant role in this. Kevin is a principal in HMS Development Corporation, and and he'll be able to talk more about that. If, however deep he wants to go into HMS, but but this project would not be in Longmont without Kevin Mulshine. And Mark, I'm gonna give you and Kevin a chance to tell that story. And Paul Melroy, Paul, Paul is, a, is the newest face to this, to this team as the executive director of the Veterans uh, Volunteer, uh, Veterans, get this right, Community uh, uh, Village Project in Longmont. Mark, correct me, what's the right title? Is that right? No, you're fine. It's a it's, uh, VCP Village, Veterans VCP Community Project Village. Village or VCP Village. There you go. All right. Yep. And, and, uh, and Paul has very specific roles and responsibilities for what's going to happen in Longmont and more broadly in, in Colorado. So welcome to all three of you. I'm going to give you a chance to embellish those backgrounds right now. Mark, what else should we know about you? Um, I think I'm a nice guy, fun to be around, uh, you know, things like that. People who know I moved to Longmont uh, just over a year ago with my family uh, to get uh, Veterans Community Project started. This did start, as you mentioned. I remember the, uh, the room we were in is a small room, uh, yeah. all audio at the time, right, for, uh, for our podcast. Big with, headphones uh, on and big microphones in front of us. Yep, absolutely. Um, how times have changed, right? And so... Uh, basically, uh, about five years ago, on a napkin, a group of combat veterans uh, got together, myself included, and we sh sketched out an idea um, for how we're going to help homeless veterans. R the idea was really to create an organization that would not say no to a vet. So if a vet came in and said, I need a whatever, the answer was going to be yes. Let's go figure out how to make that happen. So each one of us uh, who started this, all combat vets, as I mentioned. I'm an Iraq war vet, uh, getting ready to deploy again, as you mentioned. And um, at some point, every single buddy, every single person who ever served in the military, um, Paul also served in the military, I, we all took an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. 
and we were willing to defend the Constitution up to and including with our lives. That is just part of the oath. So whether you served for five minutes or 35 years, uh, whether you your discharge status was awesome or not so awesome, whatever it happened to be, the point was when you took that oath, you were willing to give up your life for your country. And we determined that that was good enough for us to make sure that you got support and whatever it is you needed when you got home uh, or got out of military service. And uh, yeah, just, just make things happen for people. So that was kind of the idea five years ago on a napkin. And we started in Kansas City, we opened an outreach center where veterans could get that that service, just walk in and say, hey, I need a, and then we just go to work. And really through the, the kindness of the community. So um, I'll let Paul talk about the name and kind of where it comes from, but it's really the kindness of the community. So we don't take any federal dollars. Um, you know, it's all, it's all privately funded through individuals or corporations, uh, grants, things like that. And we have been able to basically make an impact uh, in Kansas City. And as word spread about what we were doing, other cities said, hey, let's go do that. The part, that was phase one of our uh, impact in Kansas City was this walk-in center, basically. Phase two were tiny houses. So we started building a, a village, a VCP village uh, in Kansas City. It's now complete, uh, about two years after we started. It was 49 tiny houses and a 5,000 square foot community center. The community center is for the veterans that live in the village. They have a teaching kitchen and meeting rooms and things like that. So the houses themselves are fully code compliant homes. They meet all Kansas City building codes for new construction and they're transitional in nature for our vets. So our vets get to come in, stay for free up to typically about two years or less. Uh, there's no specific requirement there, but that's kind of our goal for getting veterans rehoused at some point uh, in more, a more permanent solution. And they live rent free and basically we hold them accountable. There's a lot of accountability that comes with that being in our program. Yet at the end of it, they basically have the opportunity to then transition to something more permanent for them that doesn't include living on the streets. And uh, word caught on quickly. Uh, you know, we, we joke a little bit about it. Our, tiniest, our tiny houses are the tiniest part of what we do. It's really our wraparound services for our veterans. And um, I'll let Kevin get into the details of how we came to Longmont, but, uh, you know, sort of long story short, uh, too late, I know. We, uh, we just broke ground today on our second ever VCP village. It'll be here in Longmont. We'll have 26 tiny houses in a 3,000 square foot community, and we're still on the search for that outreach center. It'll be somewhere in Longmont where, again, veterans can just walk in and, and get help whenever they need it. So our hope with the groundbreaking today is by next uh, fall, we should be housing veterans here in Longmont. Uh, Mark, one of the benefits of doing the backstory is these aren't sound bites. It is storytelling, and um, and we ought not to leave out the important parts of the story. So sure, don't feel yeah. like you're I just didn't want I didn't want Kevin to fall asleep, so that's why I was trying to. <laughs> I'm make sure to I stayed excited uh, about it. Uh, could you just drill down a little bit further? Because I've heard you tell the story or stories uh, about the the project's approach, both to veterans and and the concept of accountability. Yeah. Um, uh, we have another we have another entity in town that uh, that uses the word loving accountability, right? In terms of how they approach this, um, but I know I know there's a, I know there's a, a loving but a but a rigorous and a, a, a approach to accountability and high expectations. And I think that's an important part of the story that that what you do with people to reconnect them to what they're most proud of and when they were most successful. There is a a shared language and a shared experience that all people who've been in the military have. Uh, it doesn't matter if you were in the Navy, Coast Guard, Air Force, Marine Corps, now Space Force. Uh, there is a common language that we all speak, and that is military. Um, every branch has their nuance, right? But, uh, but generally speaking, we have the same. I went to a boot camp. It was going to be different than what Paul went through or, or somebody in the Marine Corps or Air Force, whatever. Um, yet there was a boot camp. And so, again, there's a shared experience. What we found is one, our program has always been designed around that accountability. We want to make sure that our veterans have all the support they need to, to be successful. And they also have to be willing and able to participate in that success. So we're not taking somebody off the streets and putting them in a house and saying, now you will fix whatever issues you happen to have. They have to raise their hand and say, I'm ready, willing, and able. Now we're going to still get them off the streets if they're not you know, ready, willing, and able. It may just mean not part of our program and that's okay. 
uh, when they're ready and they're willing and they're able, now what we do is we basically design a program around each vet. And this is the benefit we have of that flexibility by not taking those federal dollars. I can serve a vet in the way that they need it. So, um, you know, Councilman Waters, if you have a... a, I'm, a, I'm, a I'm a Longmont public media volunteer with this conversation. Longmont public media volunteer waters. Uh, if you uh, if you basically had some kind of issue, let's say it's just money. Let's say it's money issues. You you weren't good with your dollars and you had an outstanding rent collection that was due for $1,000 or $1,500 and you're just not good with your money. You can't pay it. You're living on the streets and, and you're just not making enough or you're making enough. You're bad with your money. You just have not paid that. Every time you go to rent something, they're always looking at your history and they go, nope, sorry, we're not going to rent to you. So you live in your car. Well, what we do is we can say, hey, Tim, let's have you come into our tiny house, we'll get you set up, and now we're going to put some accountability around that money management. We're going to have volunteers who come in and teach you how to manage your money. We're going to make sure you're employed correctly and you have the right dollars, and, and then the minute you save up $1,500, and we're going to have uh, case managers uh, that keep track of that, we're going to take you and we're going to pay off that old debt. Then we're going to put you back in our tiny house, and we're going to let you save some more so you have a nest egg. Uh, we have case managers, again, that, that work with our veterans. They're on an eight-to-one caseload. Most social service organizations I know are closer to 30 or 40 to one. Um, and again, it's our private funding model and through uh, donations from the public, basically, at veteranscommunityproject.org. Uh, that, allows us, <laughs> that allows us to, to, uh, to be very accountable to our veterans. The second piece, quickly, that we, we've come across that's been really neat for us is we've realized that we've created barracks style living without the barracks. And so members who join us, uh, military members, prior, mil prior service, who come into our village and we have women, men, people who were in combat, people who never saw combat, uh, it, it doesn't matter, um, you know, what branch, any of that. One lady was in the uh, Coast Guard for two years, back in the 70s, right? Um, doesn't matter as long as they served at all, then they're good in, in our program. It doesn't matter if that contributed to their circumstances or not. Our case managers uh, design a program around each vet, figure out what those issues are, and then we partner with other organizations that already are great at what they do to make sure that our vet goes and sees a, whether it's a civilian person for PTSD help or alcoholism or whatever it happens to be. Uh, maybe they just need some help with budgeting. We can have somebody come in and do that. We do all of those things. We get them all set up and then we can transition them when they're ready to the next step, whatever that happens to be. They can bring their pets. Um, we don't want to, them to leave their pets out on the streets. So we have partner with veterinary services. We just really, it's wraparound services. We make sure that veteran is taken care of in whatever way they need. And um, the, the veterans in the village also help with that barrack style living by, you know, hey, Tim, you know, I'm Mark, I'm your neighbor. And I know you're supposed to be going to this financial literacy class at 08. And it's 08, you know, 05, and you haven't left the house yet. Knock, knock, knock. Tim, why aren't you going, right? Because I like my tiny house. I'm not going to mess up my experience there, and I'm certainly not, not going to let my battle buddy or my shipmate mess up their experience either. And so we've had this neat thing happen uh, from a cultural standpoint where the military sort of concept kicks back in with our veterans, and they really look out for each other, and that's helped out a ton. We've had 73% placement uh, since we started uh, veterans running through our program. Um, again, most organizations right now are in the 30 to maybe 45% range, and we're at 73. So early data, small sample size. We're going to keep doing this for a long time, and uh, I think those numbers aren't going anywhere. I think it's going to continue to be pretty high. You just described the, the non-combat or the, the uh, domestic uh, aspect of leave, leave none of them behind. Right? Yep. So I don't think I did in the introduction uh, acknowledge that you're a lieutenant commander, and in 48 hours, you will be referred to as, I've got a, a phone going on the side over here, a lieutenant commander. But in the next 48 hours, you're a real estate agent for Kellner Williams. Yeah, correct. And, so and a year I'm, from uh, now, yep. a year from now when you return from your deployment, uh, for folks who are thinking about selling their homes, they'll uh, that'll make that note, you'll return to Longmont as a Kellner Williams 
real estate. Absolutely. And I have people in between. So if they don't want to wait a year, we got people, we'll get you hooked up. But yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, I'm the only founder that originally didn't go full time into the organization. My goal has always been to sell enough houses to write big six figure checks to the organization that I started. Uh, I can tell you my co-founder brethren are constantly asking me, where's that check? We're working on it. Um, we need to sell a few more houses to make that happen. But um, yeah, my goal has always been, you know, we have some really awesome people uh, like Paul who've been, who've been willing to join our mission. And um, they do that work day in and day out every day. Uh, I get to do the fun stuff. I get to, you know, do interviews and, and you know, speak in front of cameras and, uh, and raise money and things like that. That's fun for me. Uh, Paul and the team, they really do the hard work of day to day. Let's get stuff built. Let's help veterans. Um, and truthfully, that's their, their specialty. And that's why we have them on board. And it's just neat to be able to work or work with such uh, a good mix of talent. A crew that really understands what it means to have boots on the ground. Oh yeah. Cause they've been boots on the ground. Yeah, absolutely. So you're, you're, uh, involved in this conversation with uh, Kevin Mulshine. Now, Kevin, some people might look at this and wonder, how did Kevin Mulshine show up in, 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 in this reporting, in this program? But there's a, there's a, we wouldn't be talking about this program were it not for you. So how did you get connected with Mark and the, and the project in Kansas City? And, um, and what role have you played in bringing this project to Longmont? Sure. Thanks, Tim. No, back in uh, 2018, if you remember, there was a confluence of actions taken at the, by the city council in Longmont, which was uh, they wanted to tackle affordable housing crisis, therefore putting certain requirements on new developments to satisfy certain requirements. And they also um, adopted the, uh, the uh, a, a resolution, which is basically a challenge to end veterans homelessness in, in Longmont. So, uh, we, we were asked to be, since we've done development in Longmont, we've done certain chart, put some we chart, HMS. HMS, yes. And we put some charitable aspects into some of our developments. Recently, uh, we were kind of tagged to find the right land for a veterans facility. Uh, but with NIM, with uh, not in my backyard, NIMBY issues, it's tough to, as generous as people were, wanted to donate parcels, it's tough to do. So. I believe it was actually uh, the mayor, who, Mayor Bagley, who originally said, uh, well, why don't you just put it in your development and uh, in your next development, which is Mountain Brook, basically a 65 acre development with about 460 homes or so. And honestly, at first, we were just trying to prove you can't do it because it's never been done before. There is no new home development in the United States that's incorporated a transitional homeless facility. That's because of the, the stigma uh, of it. And... Uh, and uh, the, the city's attitude towards that was, well, this is great because we'll be the first. If there's none now, we'll be the first. And, and honestly, we've, we, we were in around the country and there's a lot of, uh, Tim, there's a lot of uh, uh, facilities in the country that are communal living, that are, maybe it's an old apartment complex or maybe it's an old uh, hotel or something. And honestly, it, uh, it gets into a lot of things of what would feel like it belongs in a new home community and uh, my last stop, it was, uh, we were giving up on it, but our last stop was Kansas City, Missouri. We had heard some things, and there was a lot of good press about uh, the Veterans Community Project. And, uh, and uh, so our last stop was in Kansas City. We had a four-hour layover. And uh, as I said, uh, the, 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 the founders pretty much blew me off the entire time I was there. But I learned to appreciate it because they were helping veterans, and they, they couldn't get themselves away from helping veterans, so they were helping somebody more important. But Tim, it's just, uh, there's a, if for anybody who's going through Kansas City that gets a chance to stop by that campus, there's a positive energy created by a couple of aspects. One is the tiny home concept provides such a dignified response and such a dignified option for housing. Uh, and it gives such a great feel to it. But then also the energy that is on the campus, it almost has to be experienced because any particular day, the campus is teeming with volunteers and also veterans who are running from one job to another or going for uh, different things. When Mark was talking about the accountability, when I got to walk around the campus after being blown off by the founders, I uh, talking to some of the veterans and they have a pretty tight schedule during the day uh, as they're working on whatever issues they need to address. And, and it had such a positive energy that at that moment, it actually went from where, well, maybe having a, a facility for homeless veterans in a new development 
maybe it won't be a stigma. And frankly, maybe it could draw people because maybe you could have, you know, we, we're going to have the traditional amenities, the swimming pool and the workout facilities and all that, and they'll be first class. But, but maybe there's an amenity we can come up with that nobody's done before. You need community compassion and, and, and community service. So I know I'd love to be able to walk down the block and, and help some uh, uh, young veteran with a, with a resume or help them with budgeting as, as Mark was talking about or, and, uh, or help build the houses. And so when it, when it turned from being something that, uh, that is, uh, has a, a negative stigma to it, it's really the way it's operated at Veterans Community Project, where we saw that as an opportunity to bring it in, make it as our component of our community, and actually make it as value added as something that would attract buyers. Because I actually think today, I, I think with all the trouble we've had, and even in 2020, I think uh, people are looking for those community service opportunities, and if they can walk down the block and and help a veteran, well, what what better what better uh, amenity could we have? So that, that's that's how we got this point. Well, I'm gonna just as I reflect just for a second on on your conversation with the mayor, and I'll say this fondly since I I do a fair amount of work with the mayor, uh, that I've known the mayor to to use language like put up or shut up. And yeah. sounds like that's was kind of a challenge for, for you and HMS. And don't you love it when you have a chance to put up? Yeah, no, yeah, which no. Is, which is what has happened here, no, uh, no. number one. Number two, the other kind of uh, narrative would be, um, you make reference to 2020, in the year we'll never forget, none of us will ever forget, no matter, you know, our children, you have very young children, no matter how old, they, how old they live to be, they'll remember even from their childhoods, the year 2020. Right. And in a year when there has been so much to be concerned about, uh, to have a project like this that represents so much hope and reason to be optimistic as you envision the people who are going to be served and how they're going to be served, um, it's, it's worth taking some time to celebrate it and reflect on it. Right. And, and to get it to where you want it to be, enters Paul Melroy <laughs> as the executive director of the VCP Village Project Longmont. And I think potentially with other, uh, other more reach beyond Longmont in the state of Colorado. <clears throat> Paul is, is a relatively new member of the team um, and has uh, a pretty broad and substantial responsibilities. So Paul, welcome to this Thank conversation. You. Uh, I, I don't know where you're living now and I don't know if you're gonna live in Longmont. I'm actually in Lyons. You're so in my Lyons. wife and I really wanted the, the Colorado experience. Well, you're gonna get we're it. we're up Lyons in the mountains. Um, so tell us about you and tell us about your role and responsibilities now with uh, this project. So I'm, I'm a, a longtime nonprofit guy, uh, a longtime arts guy. So I worked in the arts for about 25 years and was the executive director or managing director at a, a, a number of organizations. Um, so my, my experience is varied um, with that little bit of a tilt. Um, I'm also a veteran. Uh, before I ever graduated from college, I had served six years in the Navy, had four years in the reserves, and two years active duty. Um, so while I'm a, I was a peacetime veteran back in the mid-80s, um, I, I still have, I have a lot of friends who are 10, 12, 15 years older than me that are Vietnam vets. And, um, you know, have, the, the way that we've handled uh, our returning vets has always bothered me. I, I, I just felt like uh, we, we put these guys in harm's way and, um, and things happen to them during their service that affect them after they get out of their service. And I think you see that with the, the, the homeless uh, population, uh, certainly. Uh, PTSD in particular is a, is a big factor. But I, I was always bothered by, uh, by the sort of the lack of care. Um, and some of it, I don't think it's intentional. I just think the, we just as a, as a country haven't figured out exactly uh, how nuanced the, the response to all that needs to be and, and, and just how, uh, how deep that goes. So um, I was looking for a job. Uh, I had parted ways with my, my last uh, employer in Wichita. I had been running the Tallgrass Film Festival. And um, I'd seen an ad for, uh, for this position and I uh, saw it a couple times and I thought, uh, I'm an arts guy, this is social services, They'll, they won't even talk to me. 
And after I'd seen it a few times, I thought, man, it sounds like kind of, it sounds like a fun job. And I knew a little bit about the organization just because they've, they've gotten some, some national exposure and uh, was fascinated with the whole tiny house concept. And uh, so I sent my resume in and the, the gentleman that's my boss now immediately contacted me and said, yeah, you're not a good fit. Thanks, but no thanks. And I thought, okay, nothing, nothing ventured, nothing gained. No, no, no worries. And about two weeks later, I got a phone call from him saying, well, a couple of the folks on our search committee think we really ought to talk to you. And um, the next thing I knew, I was driving up from Wichita to Kansas City and had a great visit. I, I hung out for a few hours one afternoon and chatted with a number of folks. And uh, not too long after, I got another phone call, uh, clearly indicating more serious interest. And I, I went and spent a uh, better part of a, a 24 hours up there and really got to talk to folks and, and got to see the outreach center in action and got to see, I actually sat in on a, a debriefing that the, the caseworkers were doing on the clients they're working with. And I was kind of, I was hooked. I just thought this is, these guys are doing great things. Um, this is part of the solution. This is definitely a step in the right direction. And um, just was uh, just delighted to, to, to be able to come on board. Um, you know, my, my role is uh, sort of chief cook and bottle washer. Um, there's just all sorts of things that go into, uh, you know, right now my job is getting the, the village built and establishing an outreach center and getting some infrastructure in place. Um, but, you know, the, the, what's great about working for nonprofits is that no one day is like the previous day. It's going to be something a little different every day. And I'm, I'm, I'm literally watching my job sort of uh, transmogrify over time here into different things. So it's a little bit fundraising and it's good old fashioned uh, people management and planning and logistics and, you know, whatever needs to happen. And it's one of the, you know, one of the things that attracted me to VCP was that whatever needs to happen attitude. Um, if you, I, I appreciate that you suggested visiting Kansas City if you get a chance. It's, it, it's remarkable and Kevin touched on this too. When you go visit the village there and go visit the outreach center, it, it's just, the energy is incredible. There's all these volunteers and, and the staff just generally has this attitude that we don't like to hear the word no we're going to find a way to say yes. And that bleeds into the relationships with our partners. And, you know, I think that means that makes, that gets people to do things uh, that they maybe wouldn't have done or might've been on the fence about, but, you know, having a, having a great attitude and, and making it really clear what your goals are, I think is one of those, it's, it's a little bit of the magic with VCP. Um, they just, uh, they just don't like the word no. And, uh, and I love that. Um, I, I, we find ways to say yes with our veterans. We've already heard a little bit about the wraparound services. So, you know, every, every client that we get is going to require a little something different. And so my, my challenge as a manager is to, is to make sure the resources are in place that um, if, if it's, uh, you know, if there's something we can do that we'll, we have the capacity to do it. And, and that we have the partnerships with other folks in town, as, as you heard earlier, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. If somebody's doing a great job delivering meals or transporting people or whatever, uh, you know, we want to hook up with that organization and, and um, you know, find the best care that we can for our, our, our clients. Um, so, uh, you know, in, in terms of looking towards the future, I think one of the, so one of the big challenges here is Northern Colorado is not Kansas City. Um, there's a number of things that are different about the landscape here. Uh, for example, one of the big things in Kansas City that, that VCP does is give away bus passes and, and help people with transportation there. Well, here the, the transportation system is a little disjointed. There's, there's certainly ways to get from point A to point B, but it's not quite as easy here. That's going to be a factor for us here, and, and it's a, a, a continuous topic of conversation about the possibility of really need, needing to be mobile at times. And and my uh, director of veteran services, Sean, right now, that's, you know, he's working out of his house, but that's, he's going, he's going to where the, where he's needed. Um, and, um, and I think that's going to be part of our landscape going forward. Although it, I think it's really important that we get some bricks and mortar, uh, a bricks and mortar location where people can walk in 
um, I think that's just really important too. Uh, the bottom line is we want to serve as many veterans as we can get to, um, which means uh, doing the fundraising that's needed to, to have money to help them and to have, uh, to have the staff that you need to help them. Um, but it's, uh, there's a lot of magic with VCP and it's, it's amazing to me how when just a few pieces start to come together, you start to get this critical mass and all of a sudden, you know, everything's clicking on eight cylinders. Um, it's a really cool thing to, to, to see. So that's what I'm looking forward to here is sort of hitting that point of critical mass when I know that we are just cooking and we're helping a lot of people. And, and, and that we have capacity to help even more and a, and a vision for how to do it. Um, I, you know, I don't want to profess a vision right now of exactly how it's going to be because we're still figuring out what, you know, how to leverage what we do best here in Colorado. The other big factor uh, is 2020. We, we unfortunately think there's going to be more than a few people added to the roles of the homeless. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of evictions starting to happen, a lot of foreclosures. Um, whatever that number is of newly, new, newly homeless people, about a quarter of them are going to be veterans, you know, if the statistics bear, and they, they usually do. So I just, I have a sneaking suspicion there's going to be a, a, a much greater need over the coming months than there is right now. And, and we're having conversations with the other, other organizations around Longmont and Boulder County about how we're gonna, how are we gonna handle this? What do we think that's gonna look like? And what parts can, what roles can we all play to you know, find a solution to that? So it's uh, interesting times, it's like the old Chinese curse, right? We're living in interesting times. While you have the floor, uh, what do you want, what's your answer to the question to long monitors who ask, how can I help? What do you need? Boy, there's all sorts of ways to help. So. You know, obviously we have we have financial needs, and and uh, we're very fortunate to have a, a great philanthropic base. Um, but you know, we're we're expecting to provide about a million dollars worth of services a year in Longmont when we're we're fully up and running, and uh, that that takes money. So that's 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 the easy one for for some folks. Just you can just write a check, and it really helps immensely. Um, but we uh, we also love our volunteers. When we go to build the village, you know, about 70% of the construction is happening with volunteers. Uh, it's similar to the habitat model. Um, and, you know, we love our volunteers and, and we love getting them engaged because once somebody comes and works on a house, they really feel, uh, you know, some, in, uh, some investment, some psychic investment in that. And, um, you know, they get emotionally attached and we love that because they become great supporters. Uh, we'll also need people to help us out uh, when we open up the outreach center. Uh, in Kansas City, they make use of a lot of volunteers in there. I'm sure we're going to want to, too. Uh, when we open up the community center in the village, same thing. Uh, we'll be providing a lot of services there. And, and as you heard a little bit earlier, you know, uh, at the village, we try really hard to, to go above and beyond with our folks. So, you know, we, we hook them up, with, hook our residents up with vet, uh, veterinary services and dental services and things like that. So we'll be looking, you know, for, for folks in town to help with things like that, if possible. Um, there's just all sorts of ways to help. You know, you want to come do a little gardening at the village or, you know, a little landscaping. We love that. Um, you know, the, it's very easy to sign up on our webpage to be a volunteer. And um, things are a little slow at the moment, but I think come, you know, early next year, uh, things are going to ramp up real quickly. So um, we're, we're wanting to gather as many interested volunteers now as possible. So right now it would be people willing to help write checks or not help write to write checks to help with the with the economics of it, and then building cadres of volunteers so you can get yeah. them ready to step in, uh, kind of full speed, full full stride when that opportunity presents itself. Yeah, I, yeah, I want to yeah. circle it's back a... something that I we probably should have uh, touched more deeply on, um, it, just in terms of the scope of the need here. It's a, it, Mark. It's fair to assume I think that if uh, of every government, level of government and agency that a veteran turned to for assistance, if their disposition was find a way to say yes, there would not be a need for the veterans community. Absolutely true, yep. But that hasn't been the experience. And the no, net effect, in fact, uh, Paul made reference to, it's, it's not intentional that we've walked away from our veterans. I would like to turn that around and say it should be intentional 
that we walk <laughs> through our veterans or don't let don't lose connection and don't fail them when they return and that's and that's what you are committed to what's the scope of the need nationally so um yeah so nationally uh in, on any given night the numbers look to be a, approximately 40,000 people who took the same oath i did the same oath paul did uh are sleeping on the streets every night I don't know what their circumstances were. I don't know how they got on the streets. All I know is that at some point they raised their right hand, took that same oath, were willing to give up their life for their country. And now 40,000 of them every single night are sleeping on the streets. 10% of them sleep in areas that are just not fit for human habitability. Um, most of them are men. About one in 10 is a uh, woman vet. Um, it's really just kind of a, a mix of things that um, get them there. And I, I think when you look at that number, when people hear that number, what's really cool for me is that I, I look at that and I go, that's terrible. And it is. And um, it's, it's just that we've realized that it's not really insurmountable. Could this model, this tiny house model in our walk-in clinics be the thing that, that solves that problem? Can we eliminate veteran homelessness? And I think the answer is yes. It's, the, the reason it's not insurmountable, insurmountable is because we do have a, a community of people who are willing to step up and say, yeah, I can help with that. I can write a check or, uh, hey, bring them over to my uh, auto uh, repair place and I'll fix somebody's car for you at a discount or free or whatever it is. Um, Starbucks was out today helping us serve coffee to our, our uh, donors and people who came for our groundbreaking. There's lots of ways that people can, can contribute to making sure that we take care of our veterans. And so we connect those people together. So rather than have to call the VA and say, hey, I want to write a resume for a vet. How do, what do I do? Literally just call us and then we can put you in touch with any organization that needs that help or maybe it's us. So we become the clearinghouse for that. Um, two things that Paul kind of understated and, and it's, um, it's just because we are honestly, we're sort of humble people. But as we've looked into the numbers, we see that on any given night around here, we're talking close to 100 veterans that are sleeping on the streets. So any night, just think about it. You're in your house, whatever, you're watching the stars at night and there's a hundred people sleeping on the streets that were willing to give up their life for their country. How do we impact that? One person at a time. We go out, we find those people. And there are people, by the way, that are not with Veterans Community Project who are out there doing street outreach. They're reaching out to homeless people in general. They're doing amazing work. We're gonna partner with them and focus on the vet portion of that because there's some unique, unique things available for veterans, resources and all that. It's just navigating the system. So. One quick example I give people is uh, think of your uh, favorite friend who got married and decided they wanted to change their last name. Okay. Uh, so then you have documents, you got your social security number and you got your birth certificate and then you got to go somewhere and you got to see somebody and you got to stand in line and take the little number. And now it's COVID time and it's really hard. Now do that being homeless. You don't have time to go anywhere because you really don't have the resources to get somewhere. You don't, have any documentation you don't have your social some people don't even remember their social because they haven't used it in maybe a decade uh, they certainly don't have their birth certificate we are the people who will go beat down those doors figure out okay i'm gonna go find your birth certificate for you or i'm gonna go get that social security card for you then i'll go help you figure out where at the va or what government organization can help us with the next step and sort of clear the roadblocks because with federal dollars comes things like hey it's thursday and it's sunny out and it's 95 degrees there's an organization at you know third and third that will help you. Uh, but if it were Monday and sunny out in 95 degrees, then you gotta go over here. And yeah. so we just can weed through all of that and make sure that that works. And so um, having those community partners, uh, you know, basically just being willing to put up with the bureaucracy and figure it out so that the vet comes to us and then we go figure out the answer um, to, to what Paul was saying earlier. For example, in Northern Colorado, he mentioned transportation. Um, it is about an hour and 15 minutes from my house to the Cheyenne VA. So I can go up to a different state and visit the VA. If I want to hop on a bus and get to the VA in Aurora, uh, it would take me maybe about four hours. Okay. So again, you know, imagine we had a vet uh, not too long ago in Kansas City. He needed some help and uh, the, our staff was on the phone for eight hours on hold with various different organizations. Now imagine again, okay, if you've got time and you've got nothing going on, great. You sit in front of your phone and you just, you know, put it here or just, you know, wait, it's painful and it's annoying and whatever. If you're homeless, where do you plug your phone in? And oh, by the way, everything's shut down for COVID. So I can't even go into a building and wash my hands if I have a cough, right? So all of these things are becoming more and more complicated and it is too easy to look and go, eh, somebody else will take care of that. Well, the reality is, yes, somebody's taking care of that. It's just really hard to navigate. So tell you what, you just come to us, 
we will figure it out. I don't know the answer. That's no problem. We'll go figure it out. And that's, that's the beauty of, I think, where we have carved this niche. There are so many, and you referenced it, Tim, there are so many amazing organizations and people out there who are willing to do this every single day. Um, vets are unique, and they also, uh, the veteran organizations are sometimes unique depending on funding. And so, again, our job is just don't worry about any of that stuff. Come see us. We'll help you out. And Paul has already helped with Sean um, house veterans. We're doing that now. We won't have houses, tiny houses, for maybe another year. And we're already starting to house people because put some veterans in a room and tell them you can't do something, well, yeah. we're kind of hard-headed, as our wives yeah. will tell you, and uh, we're just going to go solve problems. So we've already started housing veterans and getting them help and support, and and Paul and the team have just stepped up and, and done that. They're not going to wait for tiny houses. They're just going to go do it. So um, to, to, to bring this back to home, I, every once in a while, I'll put my city council hat on in these, in these sessions, uh, because the council has been through a series of Oh, actually, last summer went through a series of conversations about understanding the breadth and the scope and the depth of our homeless challenge and the needs of our homeless population in Longmont. And, uh, and quickly came to the realization that the, our homeless population isn't some monolithic group. It's a bunch of segments. It's families living in car with children. It's seniors who are housing uh, uh, insecure or homeless. Um, it's our disabled community. And, and one of those segments is our, is our veteran community with the associated issues of, of um, uh, PTSD and, you know, and, and, and what goes along with that. If you look at, if you look at the whole uh, continuum, it, it does feel like an elephant you're trying to swallow. But when you break that down into the, into the, into the populations and you say, okay, what's the need and how, we can, and how can we solve the problems or respond to the needs here? It's real doable, segment by segment. And, and, and right now, I'm really optimistic that for our homeless population, or for our veteran population who are homeless in Longmont, we can solve that problem. We don't need the VA. We don't need, they could help. We don't be we need them dependent to help. <laughs> on the VA. We're not dependent on HUD. We can solve this problem right here for a population that deserves the best we can bring them. And it is gonna take, so to that point, Tim, it, it's gonna take creativity, right? So you've got hardworking folks that we're gonna go out every day and we're gonna work really hard to just solve problems. And again, it's kind of that military mindset. I can't, you know, if I'm gonna take a country at some point, right? I can't just do that thing. I gotta go step by step. What are the battle plans and all that? We also know that no plan ever survives first contact with the enemy. So we're sure. constantly adjusting what we're doing, right? Um, I want to kind of redirect this back towards Kevin because um, that well, I was, creativity, that's where I was going next. So well, go, and that go, go. creativity is so in Kansas City, we bought five acres of land, we built these houses, it was great. The city helped us with infrastructure. I mean, I'm underplaying that, but it was amazing. And so here we are today. Then we come to Longmont, and Kevin and I joke all the time. He said, basically, hold my beer, and I'm just going to one up what's going on there, right? Um, and so it's that creativity that allows us to be able to impact veterans' lives every day. My hope is also that there's an impact on the greater homeless population as a whole. Even though this segment is what we focus on, I think there is that uh, not in my backyard thing that Kevin mentioned earlier. And now we're purposely putting people that are homeless in your backyard. And people right now seem to not have any issues with that. And I don't think they're going to going forward. We've raised property values in Kansas City in the area that we put our houses in, uh, not only the property we're on, but the surrounding area. We're going to be in a high-end subdivision here, and we're going to keep values high and engage the community. I think Kevin talked about it today at our groundbreaking ceremony about different ways to engage people who are buying a lot in the, you know, in the, in the neighborhood and how they can help us uh, help veterans. And so I think that sort of starts to go at that, that whole NIMBY, not in my backyard thing. Well, I want to, I want to turn back to Kevin and, and um, the creativity that's associated with this project. And while I get, I get Paul's concerns about not articulating too much of a vision because times are so uncertain and there's so much in flux or in change right now, but there is a design, right? That is the reflection of a, vi of, of a vision or the manifestation of a vision. And when we talk about a village, I, I think people ought to have a, a, a sense, Kevin, uh, this isn't just a, a collection of tiny homes. There's a, there's a plan um, and there's a commitment to creating an environment of, and, and aesthetics um, that, that most people 
they're going to have to show up to see how it really plays out. But talk a little bit about what those commitments are to create a place for people that, 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 that honors their service and their dignity and, and, and is a place for people to be proud of where they live. Yeah, no, thank you. No, that that's, um, goes back to our issue, which we were discussing before, which is taking what is a transitional homeless facility and frankly, because of their management of ECP, turning it into something that's more of a, uh, as I say, it's an amenity and it's a chance, uh, as I say, I would live next door to 8900 Truth, which is their address in Kansas City. And uh, I really do, as we talk to our builders and they get to know VCP and they're the ones that are actually selling the houses, they're very excited about the concept because you get young families move in. What better lesson for your kids than to be able to understand that we have to give back and help. And, uh, and I think so many people, you know, Tim, the city's moved towards trying to come up with smaller units, higher densities yeah. and lower prices, which we're trying to do. We're trying to bring in condos at $300,000 and keep on and that. Yeah, no. So it's, it's, it's work, workforce housing that we take very serious, but for people like me, uh, you know, empty nesters at this point, what better opportunity to have something to do than be able to walk down the block and help people who do, did something that I didn't have to do. I didn't have to give that out. So I actually owe more then, uh, you know, I'm always blessed that Mark, I get to work with people like Mark who are giving back after they're, while they're still giving. But, uh, but I didn't have to, I didn't have to go uh, give the oath to serve my country. And I owe them a, a lot. So what, what better opportunity for me as, a, as I say, an empty nest than to be able to help, be able to make it part of a neighborhood where I can walk down and help uh, help somebody who's, who, who had to go through that. So. Kevin, if people want to, I know you have visuals of right. the design. If people wanted to, if there was some place that people wanted to go take a, a look at, what's this gonna, what's this gonna look like when it's built out? Where would they go to, to see the visuals? Uh, I'm, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to give you that. I'll, I'll give I'll you tell that. You, I can tell you where to go. It's veteranscommunityproject.org, <laughs> and you can actually click. There's a Longmont tab, and you can click right there, and the donate button is right there as well. So you can Very do all good. of those things. Listeners, all at once. listeners, there you go. It, it's probably worth right in that moment as well reminding um, those who, who view this. Uh, that Longmont is the first, but how many communities across the country have expressed interest in potential expansion beyond Kansas City? So we've actually had 3,000 plus cities reach out to us. We've had over 700 that are serious about it. Uh, Longmont is our first, and uh, I'm going to venture to guess you're going to see some announcements from VCP. It really, it's going to be probably about every three or four months we're going to be announcing actual groundbreaking in new new cities. So uh, we're on a huge trajectory. Our goal is eight different cities by uh, 2022. And right now there's, there's uh, resources uh, and dollars, uh, again, not trying to be silly, but resources and dollars are what holding us up from building these villages all over the country. So uh, somebody wants to write a check for $100 million, we'll make this happen tomorrow. But uh, we're going to keep working on that, right? But yeah, it is, um, it, it's happening. And again, I think people with a vision, uh, Tim, you and the city council and, and people like Kevin just look at this and they go, we can do that. And it's different. It's not, oh, I don't want that over here. I want that on the other side of town. It's like, man, I want that right here, right where I'm at. And how do I do that? And how, I, how do I contribute to that? Um, and, and again, I think that that's, that's a winning combination. The tiny houses are that shiny penny and that's great. We're gonna continue to, to make sure that we can um, you know, hire case managers and, and solve problems for, for people. All right, fellas, I've kept you at this long enough. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a chance to make any last comments, but here, he'll be mine. Um, so the, the, the long monitors who, who view this, just to kind of digest this, of the 3,000 communities that expressed interest in 700 serious, Longmont is the first. So Longmonters, we need to set the standard, right? We need to be first, best, and always setting the standard, right? Um, so when people look around and see where can this work in ways to which we aspire, we ought to be the place that, that they turn to. So that's the challenge. What's the last comments that you fellows would like to make? You don't mind me going first because I want Mark to go last, but uh, Tim, I, I think uh, I do get a little bit of a challenge when we say other cities and, and Mark references eight other cities. And I've always told uh, Mark that what my goal, we've taken the design, we don't mess with their, their floor plan for their tiny homes, but we wanna put nice front porches. We're giving them the most amazing views of the front range. And our goal is, 
that when Mark gets a call from a large donor or a corporation that wants to see a facility, they fly to, they fly, they come to Longmont, Colorado, they don't go to Kansas City, nothing against Kansas City, but it's a challenge to make us, and, and making it attractive, part of it is the aesthetics, but more of it is just that energy of volunteers and having people out there uh, that, that, are, that are working every day to, to, to make the, uh, to help the veterans. And, and, and so I, I really look forward to it. Thank you. Paul, any last comments? Welcome back. We lost yeah. you there for a minute. Any last comments you want to make? I think you're on mute. You're on mute, Paul. This is this is COVID stuff right here. It's COVID life, stuff. Right? It's, you know, yeah. we're we're gonna. You mentioned uh, adjusting and adjusting and adapting and adapting. Yeah, well, that's that's what we're doing right now. Yep. So, Paul, we lost your visual and we and you're still muted. All right, Cal, can you hear me now? Last, last comments. All right, um, we're incredibly appreciative of the of the chance to do this here. Um, and as has been said earlier, just the uh, the community has been really welcoming, um, very supportive, and um, I feel like we're all rowing in the the same boat together in the same direction. So that's that's a that's a pretty cool thing. Yeah, especially for the Navy guy over here, he likes that. Yeah, go good Navy reference. Good job. There you last go. word, Navy guy. Um, I, I want to just reiterate that we, um, when we started this five years ago, I could never have imagined that I'd be on a video call one like this, but, but really with people like you, um, you know, with a city council person from the city of Longmont, the, the city manager was, was giving a, a speech today about working with us, um, developers like in business with, uh, and I know it's a nonprofit, it's still a business with talent like Paul, uh, the team we have here in Colorado, the team we have in Kansas City. J quick note to our groundbreaking ceremony. I think it was all but three of the staff people from Kansas City carpooled, whatever they could, drove trailers, and they brought all of that stuff out here and themselves to make sure that one, they were here for this uh, historic event, and two, that they helped us set up and tear down and did all that. Three people remained behind to make sure we were still taking care of vets. I mean, this is who these people are. It's an amazing group of people. Uh, I am super excited, uh, even though I'm going to be gone for a year. Paul's mission now, I've, I've tasked him with it as, as a co-founder. <laughs> that, like, that means anything is he will be done with this village by the time I get back or else. Um, but in the meantime, it's just, uh, I am just humbled and, and, and honored to have, uh, you know, been one of the guys that started this and came up with the idea, but it's really about the and the amazing people we're meeting in, in places like Longmont and Boulder County and, and the Denver area. Uh, the attention we're getting from national media and the governor came today. You know, things like that are really going to help us uh, solve this problem. It's just, it's not, it's unacceptable. It's just not insurmountable. And I think we need to remember that it's just one step at a time. Let's just move forward, help us do what we need to do for our veterans. And those hundred folks that are sleeping on the streets around here, that's gone quickly. Uh, whether we have houses or not, we're going to make that go away. And then we're going to build houses. We're going to make other towns. We're going to be able to help them as well. And so this is just a thing that builds on itself and it just starts in a town and it's as easy as people in Longmont just saying, Hey, I just want to do something. How can I help veterans community project.org. Well, Longmonters and whoever else watches this, that's the backstory on this chapter of the veteran of the VCP village in Longmont. Uh, this isn't the end of the story. This is just the end of this chapter. Uh, Mark, God, Godspeed uh, to you and, and good luck in the next year. We'll look forward to your return. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.